Hi, and welcome to today's webcast. I'm Professor Kenny Tapp. And today we're talking about two topics, the conservation of energy and the conservation of linear momentum. Let's talk about energy first. There's one guiding principle that affects the energy in the world around us, and that principle is simply, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred. When we think about energy, we think about our personal energy, right? Well, how do I get the energy to move through the day to study hard? Maybe you've asked yourself that several times, especially in the late afternoon after you've had two or three Mountain Dews or Starbucks. Where does the energy come from? It comes from what you're consuming, right? More calories equals more energy, etc. Well, where does the produce that you consume come from? Well, let's take example of a vegetable. The vegetable comes from a plant. Where does the energy come from for that plant to grow and produce the vegetable? It comes from solar radiation, the sun's energy, and rainwater, etc. So you're just transferring, transferring energy from one source to another. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred. There are two types of energies that we are primarily focused and concerned about in physics. And that is kinetic energy and potential energy. Now kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It requires that an object of mass have a velocity. It's in a state of motion. In fact, the equation for kinetic energy is simple. It's one half mv squared. The abbreviation for kinetic energy, Ke, is equal to one half mv squared, where m is mass and v is velocity. So an object has to have a non-zero velocity in order to have kinetic energy. This little red car on this football field, it's just sitting still. Its velocity is zero. Therefore, its kinetic energy, through the equation of kinetic energy, one half mv squared, the v is zero, zero times anything is zero, it has zero kinetic energy. Now, if the object has a velocity, then it has kinetic energy. The second type of energy that we're concerned with is potential energy. And potential energy is the energy of position. The equation for potential energy starts off with the variable u. Now, we do not use PE traditionally because P as a variable could stand for another thing in physics, which we'll get to very soon. Instead, we use capital U. U is equal to mgh. M for mass, g for the gravity, 9.80 meters per second squared, and H stands for height. So it requires that an object of mass be at some height. Right now, this car is at the surface, which height equals zero, which means if height is equal to zero, zero times anything in the equation for potential energy means that the potential energy is zero. If you change its height, it will change its potential energy. So when we talk about changing energy, we need to keep in mind of the concept that energy can only be transferred, it can't be created or destroyed. That brings us to the conservation of energy. The conservation of energy looks at the total energy of a system, which we symbolize with the letter capital E. EI is equal to EF, that is the conservation of energy. It tells us that the initial total energy of a system is equal to the final total energy of a system. They're equal to each other, so energy, we didn't create it, we didn't destroy it, we perhaps only transferred it. We look at EI is equal to EF, that's where we look at, okay, what is the total energy made up of? Well, there's only two types of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. So in the equation, EI is equal to EF, initial is equal to final conditions. That means we'll look at all of the kinetic and potential energy initially, and then we'll look at all of the kinetic and potential energy in its final condition. So take for example, we've got these two blocks of wood. Both of these blocks of wood are cut at the same angle. We can see that very clearly. Let's take our model car and we'll put it at the position here of this block that is noticeably smaller, and we let it go. Boy, this car only went five yards on our wonderful football field of science. Let's put it on the other block of wood, the same incline, but you'll notice that the car's starting position is higher than the other block. All right, we made it 10 yards, cool. The car made it a greater distance because when it left the bottom of the ramp, it had a greater velocity. It had a greater motion. It had kinetic energy. When the car was starting at the top of the ramps, the initial velocity was zero, which meant that it had zero kinetic energy. It wasn't in motion at all. Instead, it was at a height above the ground, above the surface. Thus, it's an energy of position. It has potential energy. When the car made it to the very bottom of the ramp, it's at height equals zero, which meant it had 
Zero potential energy. So what happened? It converted the potential energy to kinetic energy. That's what happened. So we can set up the equation very simply put. The initial energy of the system is all potential energy because this object has zero velocity. We can calculate it if we measured the height of this car, we measured the mass of the car. Then we let it go and it achieves some sort of velocity by the time it hits the bottom of the ramp. So therefore, it's at the bottom of the ramp, it's at height equals zero, which means no potential energy, it's all kinetic energy. So on the left side of the equation, when you look at EI, you've got initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy. There is no initial kinetic energy because the object has zero velocity. So it really only has potential energy to begin with. Equals to EF on the right side of the equation, there we have the final amount of kinetic energy plus the final amount of potential energy. Now, as we stated, it's at the ground at its final condition. It's at height equals zero, which means there is zero potential energy. So the only thing on the right side of the equation in its final condition is kinetic energy. So the equation turns out in this case to be potential energy is equal to kinetic energy. We so notice that mass is featured on both sides of the equation, which means it can cancel out on both sides, which tells us that in the conservation of energy, it is independent of mass. So all we're left with from the potential energy is gravity times height is equal to one half velocity squared. So from that setup, we know if we can measure the height. We know what gravity is, which means we can calculate the final velocity of this car at the bottom of the ramp. Just from our simple demonstration earlier, we know that the car achieved a greater velocity from this ramp because it started out at a much higher position. So we can use the conservation of energy to predict or calculate what the final velocity of an object is going to be if we know the height. If you knew what the velocity was, then you could also backwards calculate what the original height was. This is all to say that under the conservation of energy, looking at kinetic energy versus gravitational potential energy, when you change the height of an object, that will alter its final velocity. We can do this in a lab experiment. We'll take away the blocks of wood and we're left here with a simple metal sphere. Now this metal sphere we can use on a car track, a ramp if you will. And on this ramp we can add some books. We're going to add a good old world atlas. Now, what we're going to test in this experiment is we're going to test essentially the effects of changing height and the velocity and distance that the metal sphere can achieve. In order to do that we do actually need to know the mass of this metal sphere. So with me I've got this handy dandy scale. We'll go ahead and turn it on, it zeroes it out, and this thing is measuring things in grams. So when I put the metal sphere onto the plate We've measured the mass of this metal sphere, this ball bearing, to be 66.8 grams. In physics, the official units of mass has to be in kilograms, so I'll let you make that conversion on your own. We're going to test the effect of height on the velocity and distance of this metal sphere, this ball bearing, can achieve. So we're going to have some world atlases that we're going to stack. So we're going to need a handy dandy ruler to measure the height and we're going to measure this in centimeters. Okay, so the height of this first book is at two and a half centimeters. At two and a half centimeters, we let the ball go. Voila! We find that the ball landed at the 25 yard line on our wonderful football field of science. That was at two and a half centimeters. Let's add another World Atlas book. Now we are at five centimeters. At five centimeters, we're going to let this thing go. And we see that it made it all the way down to the 10 yard line. It achieved a much greater distance because it left the ramp with a greater velocity. Let's add another wonderful world atlas. We will measure the centimeters and we are at right at seven centimeters. We'll take our ball bearing. Touchdown!